What's up, guys? This is Justin, and this is the Welcome to Your Doom Show. This is episode number 22, and this is my pitch for the Green Lantern Corps film. So what is the Green Lantern Corps film? Well, the Green Lantern Corps is supposed to be coming out in 2020, and it's supposed to be set in the DC Extended Universe of films. So Wonder Woman, Justice League, Batman vs. Superman, uh, Man of Steel, all that jazz. So as it's titled the Green Lantern Corps, we're hoping to see more of the core, not just Hal Jordan flying off into space and fighting giant poop monsters. The film that came out prior to this uh, with Ryan Reynolds didn't really capture any of the things that Atul or I feel make the Green Lantern character and books and mythos special. It really glossed over a lot of the important characteristics of that entire universe, let alone just character, um, and really made a very generic, kind of boring film. So my pitch, I don't know if it's ever doable, I don't know if it's going to be better than the original, or worse than the original, or whatever, but this is just my some ideas I'm kicking around. There's a lot of inspirations from some of the different books and uh, other films that are not Green Lantern, and I hope that it hits a lot of the notes that I go over in the episode. So, unfortunately, you're only getting me this episode, because we had some scheduling conflicts the week that we recorded, it was just busy, so Atul and I couldn't get together and do this, but we agreed that this would be kind of a cool episode, and we'll see where it goes. You can hit me back in the comment section if you like or don't like the ideas. If you think I'm out of my mind, go for it. I can take it. Or if you want to email us directly, we're at welcome to your doom, welcome to your doom show at gmail.com. And check out our website at welcome to your doom show.com. Thanks for checking us out, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to your doom. Green Lantern books basically reinvigorated my interest in comic books in the you know early 2000s. Um, Jeff Johns had put out, uh, I think it was Secret Origin, and then they did Rebirth, and they had all these really good series coming out, and you get to see the core really working together. It's not just like, you know, the Green Lantern and the Justice League. It's like you've got stuff going off in like these vast reaches of space, and you could do some, so much with it, so many unique things. Um, it was also kind of cool because like, you have this hero who has this ring on and can do pretty much anything with it. So it invites a lot of creativity in the books. Uh, you get to see all kinds of crazy stuff, which is neat. Like you get to see like the common like boxing glove things or, or hands grabbing things or, you know, energy beams, whatever. But then you've got other characters like a Kyle Rayner, who's like an artist by day and everything he does is like crazy manga or so you get to see all kinds of like unique character traits just based on how they use the rings. Um, so that's some of the things that I was interested in. Um, I also remember when I was a kid, my uh, dad had this ring and it had a, an actual star sapphire in it. And I remember picking up the ring and like playing with it and making pretend I could like shoot lasers out of it. And it was just silly kid stuff. But, but yeah, so that's kind of, uh, you know, a, uh, an original origin of where the love of the Green Lantern character came from. It's just, uh, I think it's an interesting character. I think it's a great book. Um, interesting set of characters. But anyways, so let's talk about this film. So in my eyes, you probably have Hal Jordan as the lead. He's kind of the most um, recognizable Green Lantern. He's the hothead, um, very ready, aim, fire. No, wait. That's not right. Ready, fire, aim kind of character. He's very impulsive. Um, doesn't always th think things through. And he's not a very fallible character. He's interesting in that. You can really build, at least I think, you can build a story around him that essentially it's not about him. He's kind of this unmoving uh, character then all the events kind of go on around him. So similar to Superman in my eyes. Because again, that's another character that you're not going to see him bend a lot, but he will have to be put into situations that force him to bend in some way or another. So I think Jordan would be a good one for this. Um, and wherever he goes, you can always introduce other lanterns that are either earthbound, so that way you have some tie to the DC universe. Um, or obviously the core is huge. You can start focusing on other ones. I mean, the first movie could even be Abin Sur. Um, but for me, I'm going to say my character of choice is Green Lantern, Hal Jordan. Um, Sinestro is obviously, uh, for those who don't know, he was a Green Lantern originally, the one that trained Hal Jordan, and eventually he went dark side and um, abused his power of the ring for his own personal gain of his own planet, and uh, he was stripped of his ring, and then eventually got his own power ring and core, and basically he's like the penultimate 
villain of the Green Lantern series, in my opinion. Um, also, the origin of a really great book series called the Sinestro Core Wars. So I certainly recommend that if you're listening to this. So uh, just setting that up, you're obviously I'm going to start going through and have a bunch of different like um, lanterns I might mention. The who's and the what's of the lanterns aren't super important, mainly because there's so many of them and there's such a, a library of good, interesting characters you can pull from. So, um, you know, I, I'll be pitching out names. Doesn't necessarily have to be those lanterns, and there could be a lot more. Um, but the main purpose is that if the lanterns are in the story, hopefully they serve some purpose. Um, so what are a few things I don't want to see? So I really don't want to see another origin story. I think that the origin of the Green Lantern series can really be told in, you know, a nice opening narr narration um, talking about who they are, what they do, where they're from, and what their job is. That's really all you need. Um, you can set up everything really, really quickly. Like look at like a Guardians of the Galaxy. They set up pretty much who the Guardians were in that universe very quickly. Um, so I don't think you need some big overblown origin story. How did he get the ring? How does he get to Oa? Training sequences. I think that some things could be interesting, but like you don't need a full blown um, uh, origin story for this character. Um, other thing, and I'm adamant about this, um, Uthel and I talked about this in length too before, I, not on this podcast yet, but uh, we don't want to see Earth. Keep Earth out of this. I don't want them to go back to Earth. I don't want them to meet any of the, the heroes from Earth yet. I just want them to go and do stuff in space. Keep it in space. Make it super interesting that way. Um, space is a big, big place. You can find some pretty cool settings in it. Um, some stuff I really want to see. So um, the whole concept of constructs in the film that came out with Ryan Reynolds wasn't really explained. All of a sudden, some guys have swords, and he's making giant Lego tracks or Hot Wheels tracks. And it, it wasn't really explained like why anyone would do that aside from use your imagination as jeffrey rush put it um talk about like the advantages of it talk about that it's really in the eye of the beholder um talk about y there really are no limits or talk about what the limits are of the rings how long do they need to be um how long can you use them until they need to charge what can't you do with the rings? Uh, what are the rules around that? The no killing clause. I mean, that's in the books. So the rings will physically not allow a person to kill somebody. Um, so there's checks and balances on the rings. Stuff like that would be kind of interesting to see, like the rules of the core. Um, what else? I mean, the core is an organization. You didn't really get to see any of that in the original film either. It was just, uh, you know, them kind of shooting off into space and you see a bunch of guys in the background, um, which is not interesting. I mean, there's so much... Um, depth you can get from so many of these different characters that like there should be more by play you should see them like in the mess hall talking like i'm thinking of like from the film aliens um when they all come out of cryo sleep right they're all just kind of standing around but everybody intermingling with each other gives everybody a little bit of character and then you actually sympathize with these characters throughout the journey of the film and i think that something like that in a green lantern film would be super important um Sinestro, uh, I would say, well, you'll when I actually start pitching what I'm thinking about the movie, but um, Sinestro is my main villain. Um, I don't want to see his origin story again because I think that him as a lantern is a very similar type of lantern as Hal Jordan, except the only difference between the two is Hal Jordan's not going to go dark side until he parallaxes and does. If you don't know what parallax is, you're not going to need to find out for, for this podcast yet, but... Uh, Look up Parallax and Hal Jordan, and you'll get a whole bunch of interesting stuff on that. Um, so anyway, Sinestro is kind of my baddie. I, I I approach him kind of the way that like you have a Darth Vader or um, a Voldemort in a sense that he is the guy that's so bad um, that nobody even really wants to talk about him. Um, he's a very complex character. All of his stuff was done with his own motivations, and it all made sense to him, but it just all went horribly wrong and he's he's at fault but um he doesn't see that he's made a mistake he thinks that it's everybody else is out to get him so that's kind of just a few things i kind of wanted to level set um so let's get into this this is kind of the the this is my pitch and you'll see that a lot of the stuff that i pulled like you're going to see influences of films like star wars obviously um you're going to see 
maybe some influences of like Guardians of the Galaxy. Definitely some influences from um, the animated film Green Lantern First Flight, which is almost a perfect Lantern film, I'd say. It has a surprises, fantastic voice acting. Like it, I remember when the first Green Lantern film came out, I sent a super angry email to Uttal and it basically just said, why couldn't they just remake that movie shot for shot in live action? Um, that's also a pitch because I think that would be a great movie, but uh, I don't know that that, I feel like that's a cop out. So I'll, I'm going to throw out some ideas and uh, we'll see if any of it actually makes sense. So this is my pitch. So basically, the movie opens up, and I'd say you've got some kind of narration really to set up the scenes for the Lanterns. Jordan, you know, Jordan's narrating, saying who he is. He's from Earth. He's the Sector Lantern of 2814. Um, but the Guardians just deployed him on a mission to a planet, a planet called Yismult. There was a prison there, and essentially the prisoners got out. The prisoners there are a group of five terrorists called the Five Inversions. And there was a small group of, le- of lanterns in that sector close by that went to investigate. And now they're pinned down. They're low on resources and they have no way out. So Lantern Jordan ends up getting called out there with backup. Essentially, his backup's not there yet and probably won't get there until late. But he's on his way to Yismult. He manages to make it there in record time knowing how Hal Jordan flies. And... Um, he realizes that the inversions are nothing to be messed with. There's five of them, but there's one that stands out as the super powerful one, and that is Atrocitus um, from the Green Lantern books. So after a, a good amount of fighting and Jordan trivializing things, he ends up being able to um, to put the five inversions back in their prisons on Yismalt. And obviously this would be with the help of his backup, who I mentioned backup earlier. That would be Kilowog, the giant bad ape looking green lantern with the big little i don't know what he has he got a little like it's almost like a skin mustache it's very strange but uh he's a bad mofo um lantern kilowog is just this giant character and he could probably take on the inversions fisticuffsies but with the ring he's completely a force to be reckoned with and him and jordan along with the other uh, more junior lanterns we'll say are able to actually destroy not destroy but but recapture all the inversions and lock them back up in their cells so the last one to get locked up and is still giving some trouble is uh, atrocitus and basically the whole concept of this prison is just like wrong it doesn't seem right it's nothing that's been lantern sanctioned completely off the books they really didn't have much information about this prison on yismalt other than the fact that it existed and that there was a problem there so um, the Lanterns end up uh, trying to interrogate him, and he doesn't really give away much aside from rambling on about the War of Light and prophecies and seeing the future and the Lantern Corps will go down. But he does say something interesting about his home planet on, on Ryut uh, in Sector, let's say Sector 666. Anyways, his home planet of Ryut and what the Lanterns did to them. And uh, so they basically shackle him back up and they take off. At this point, they're all imprisoned again. Now enters some shadowy figure, and the shadowy figure is the one that actually locked or uh, broke them out. And uh, he doesn't end up breaking them back out. He just wanted to see what they do. And all he really says is, you've done exactly what I wanted. Trostus doesn't know what to think of that. He starts yelling back at him, and then the figure disappears. But Atrocitus is left there without his muzzle, which he had on before the lantern's gone. So at this point, you've got an unmuzzled Atrocitus. That'll come back later. Um, so anyway, skip ahead. Lanterns return back with um, with Hal and the rest of them back to Oa, the um, headquarters of the Green Lanterns. And they basically present their findings to the Guardians, who are the leaders of the Green Lanterns. These little blue dudes with really big heads. Um super powerful, super old. They basically are the epicenter and the, um, I don't know, I guess the command of the Green Lanterns. The Green Lanterns are their peace, uh, is their peace corps and their, um, their military, I guess, and they police the entire universe. So they present their findings to the Guardians and they say, well, yeah, you mentioned this planet Ryut and I, we don't have much on it. And, um, they just dismiss it. They say, there's nothing to know. There's nothing to see there. Don't worry about it. Peace out. Get out of here. Okay. So they leave. 
And Jordan, that doesn't sit well with Jordan. So he's just kind of like, hmm, something's wrong here. So he goes to Salak, the the kind of the, the lantern that runs the entire... Uh, he kind of runs deployments and missions for the Guardians. The Guardians give the orders to Salak and he delegates and whatnot. But he is also pretty knowledgeable about the systems and knowledge base at the uh, at, at Oa. And Salak basically goes through and all he could find is that Ryu was a place that is in Sector 666, which is also known as the Restricted Sector. There's nothing there. Um, but obviously every sector has a Green Lantern and that Green Lantern is a character known as Moro. Uh, Grim Reaper looking mofo and uh, Moro ends up meeting up with Jordan in the crypt of the Green Lanterns where you see all the fallen soldiers and um, Lantern Moro discusses with Hal basically saying that hey this is a completely dead sector there's nothing in Ryut um, I could be pronouncing it wrong but anyways I'm going to keep saying Ryut or Ryut so he goes over to this planet along with another ragtag bunch of lanterns. Um, I'd say probably Kilowog. Um, they don't select a character named Bzzd because Bzzd is literally a wasp lantern. They Everybody just kind of thinks of him as a bit of as a joke. Um, but they end up getting another... Uh, you can have Sodom Yat. Basically it would be a, a collective of four or five lanterns each one with their own character traits and whatnot. And I'm not going to get into the specifics of that again, because that's just way too detailed. I ain't got time for that. But they end up going to Ryut, and it really is a desolate place. All the rings are searching for signs of life. They find nothing, absolutely nothing. They're going through ruins. There's barely anything. It's just rubble. But they do find one free-standing structure that still exists, and they go through, and there's a bunch of murals, and you see blood sacrifices and all kinds of stuff, which is obviously makes sense, given that it's Atrocitus' planet, the blood dude from Act 1. Um, but then they end up entering a chamber, and they find this giant stick on the ground, some sort of a weapon. And Hal tries to pick it up on his own without aid of the lantern, and he can barely even move it. And he goes, what the heck is this? Kilowog, the giant, goes and picks it up, picks up this giant staff with ease, because he's about eight feet tall, spins it around, and then it goes off and just blasts a hole into the the wall, let's say, of this, so this freestanding structure. And they're just, who would have a weapon like this? And then all of a sudden, they realize that right behind them is this this thing that's even bigger than, than, um, than Kilowog, this giant, robotic, blue-faced-looking creature that lunges after them. He's dismantled. He's got no arm. He's just hobbling out. Guts are, not guts, but like robotic guts are out. And he starts chasing them down. The lanterns manage to subdue him pretty easily after he wounds one or two of them. And um, they examine it and they're looking at it and it's technology they've never seen before. It's older than they, any of the lanterns have ever seen. They're not able to analyze it on the field, so they have to take something back to Oa. So they end up breaking through the... Uh, they, they end up taking, like, its memory core or something like that. Something hand-sized that they can they can shuttle back. Um, meanwhile, while this is all happening, you've got somebody, again, some cloaked, mysterious figure in the... Uh, in space, basically overseeing everything and is just basically acknowledging that everything is going according to plan. I know, mystery, right? Uh, so skip ahead. You end up getting back to Oa, and the Lantern contingent that was on the planet Ryut is trying to get more information on what this technology is. So they bring it to the resident uh, tech head on Oa, Stell. Stell's basically a lantern. He's a robotic lantern who's been broken apart so many times. He's just kind of kept together by the power of his own ring. Uh, but he's still a Green Lantern, he still knows his stuff. And as he's going through the technology, he's kind of flabbergasted because the technology appears to be made of what he would consider antimatter. It's nothing he's ever seen before, only heard about, or it's something that's experimental. And basically, the only people that would actually have access to this type of technology in the universe would be the Guardians. So it's making things a little bit strange in Jordan's head. Um, something's not right, and it seems like there's some sort of conspiracy going on with the um, the the guardians. <sighs> so, the only person that's out there right now that really has more information on the guardians, based on research that he'd been doing for God knows how long, 
is the character Sinestro. Now, like I said, he's going to probably be the villain of this story, but he's safely locked up in the science cells, basically the prison on Oa. Um, and you can detail about how it went down, how they managed to capture him, um, and kind of give a little bit more depth to the character that way. Um, but then uh, Jordan is the only one that would go and see him because he trained Jordan. So Jordan would go down to the science cells and say, look, this is what I'm looking at right now. The only characters or the only people that had access to this type of technology would have been the Guardians. Have you ever heard of something? And then you have the back play saying, oh, you don't trust the Guardians. And Jordan saying, no, it's not that. And you can kind of have the, the holier than thou kind of conversation being that the Guardians think that they're above everybody in Sinestro's eyes and, guard, and, and uh, Jordan would give them the benefit of the doubt saying like, nah, that's not the case. I don't think that. I don't think that. So you can have them going back and forth. Um, but at the end of the day, Sinestro basically just says, uh, well, all I know is that um, the Green Lantern Corps was not the first police force that the, Ga the Guardians ever created. So get the hell out of here and I don't want to talk to you anymore. This is done. You puppet of the Guardians or something. Something um, cliche. Why not? A little cliche never hurt anyone. So anyways, um, oh, he also, I would also say he suggests that if he pulled the memory chip, he'd probably be able to get some form of evidence straight from that if they can figure out what to do with this technology. So Lantern Jordan goes over to Stell and says, hey, what can you do? So they end up managing to decrypt some old video footage uh, from this chip. And this chip just basically shows the extermination of all life by these Manhunter characters. And there are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of these things descending upon this planet and just eradicating life. The whole sky goes black. It's like locusts. It's really scary stuff. And um, they're just watching in horror. And Jordan asks if that's the earliest video that they have. And he goes back as far as he can. And the last thing that, or the first thing that's on there, and the only, the, the most earliest footage is, the Guardians saying, go to Sector 666 and cleanse it. Jordan's not happy. Stell is hurt. Or not hurt, but Stell is shocked. Stell looks at Jordan and the other Lanterns who are with him and says, um, what are you going to do? Who are you going to tell? And Jordan just says, everyone. Jordan busts in with the rest of his Lantern buddies. Well, the Lantern buddies are backing him up, but Jordan's the front runner. He's the one that goes straight at the Guardians and says, you know, what have you been doing? This is what we found, etc., etc., etc. Well, the Guardians aren't happy with him. They end up calling in their Alpha Lanterns, who are essentially like the, you know, the guard. Um, and they try to restrain him, and he fights back. He fights the Lanterns and lashes out and tries to fly away. And the Guardians essentially just turn off his ring. It just goes, bloop. And then all of a sudden he falls. Guardians catch him, and they apologize and say, we need to lock him up. Well, Jordan turns around and apologizes and says, well, I apologize too because I've been transmitting everything to every ring on Oa. Everybody knows what you've done. So now all of a sudden, every lantern on Oa is aware and is shocked. They've seen the footage. They've seen them behave the way they did and restrain Jordan in the way that they did. They're not happy. So then they lock up Jordan in the science cells and he gets locked up right next to good old Sinestro. And meanwhile, while this is going on, you have all the lanterns going and protesting what's going on on Oa and their rings are just super powered protesting weapons. Maybe not weapons, but they're essentially protesting with their rings, obviously. Now the guardians becoming as nervous as they are, they decide to confiscate every single ring on Oa until the facts can be um, transmitted or communicated to the entire populace on Oa. They promise answers. No one's happy with that. Um, and meanwhile, while all this happens and all of the rings are confiscated, all the guards in the science cells leave. Jordan's still with his ring, but it's completely powerless, powerless as he's locked inside of a science cell. It won't work, and that's that. It's turned off by, by Ganthet and the rest of the guardians. Then you have Sinestro laughing maniacally. He seems like he's a pretty happy fella in that science cell. Well, Mr. Sinestro, what do you have to say? 
and Sinestro all of a sudden is rattled by a uh, well sorry the entire science cell division or not division the entire science cell section ends up getting rattled by an explosion or two or three and many then all of a sudden you have a uh, you'd cut I guess to the citadel where the um, the guardians are and then manhunters are just descending upon Oa there's again thousands to thousands of these things just descending upon Oa and then this back to the to the science cells you see Sinestro is very happy with himself and Jordan asks him what's going on and he says exactly what I wanted the manhunters are here no one escapes the manhunters and then the manhunters come and they free Sinestro and Sinestro leaves Jordan in there to stew and Jordan wants to know how this happened and basically while investigating stuff that the Guardians did back when he was beginning to not trust them, he found out about this. He found some of their old technology. And when he tried to actually reuse it, the antimatter, um, not characters, the antimatter um, life forms of Quard ended up contacting him. They're the ones that made this technology for the Guardians. They're the ones that make weapons, the weaponeers on Quard. And they don't like making weapons that don't get used. So as soon as they found somebody that was going to use their weapon, they got real excited. They fit Sinestro with something in his head to allow him to control their weapons, the Manhunters. And because of that, he's been able to command an army and basically get things going from outside of the prison while he's locked in it. He just had to patiently wait for years. Well, a year or years or however long it is. But essentially, that's been what's going on. Um, he's been silently delegating to these growing numbers of Manhunters as Quard keeps producing them for Sinestro so that he can use them against the Green Lantern Corps. So then you have the Green Lantern Corps essentially at the mercy of the Manhunters. Now, the Guardians are powerful enough to do them in, but the Manhunters have man managed to wrangle every single Green Lantern into the Citadel of the guardians and says if you guys give them a ring if we see any display of power we're going to take all of your lanterns from you and the guardians are more sympathetic than people uh, than the rest of the lanterns give them credit for they don't want to see a single lantern be killed they yield so what's the plan the end game here is well Sinestro wants to destroy the lantern battery and he wants to take away the power of the guardians in the universe he wants them eliminated he wants to be able to be the rule of the galaxy so you skip ahead and not skip ahead you change scenes and there's jordan powerless in his science cell then all of a sudden it swings open there's no reason for it and jordan's looking around like what the hell just happened and then all of a sudden a little wasp stings him on his neck he goes how turns out it's busy he was so small he evaded capture even though he doesn't have his ring and he managed to go into the lock and pick out the or basically free jordan from it he's the only lantern the guy that's the little undersized guy that nobody really thought he was coming and then he manages jordan managed to psychically communicate with ganthet and he all of a sudden you see the ring just reactivate on him and then jordan has an idea he's cut back to sinestro detailing what's wrong with the lantern core and how they failed him etc so you kind of can get a sob story from Sinestro, not a sob story, but you can sympathize with the character. You can see why he's fallen to the um, the place that he's at. And then Jordan walks up, again, not in Green Lantern uniform, powerless. And he basically just tries to plead with Sinestro to stop what he's doing. Sinestro's not having that. They go back and forth and there's an argument. And then at some point, Sinestro asks him again, says, how did you get out of your science cell? And then he turns and says, or he, he says something to him along the lines of, you don't have your ring, what are you going to do? Or sorry, your ring has no power, what are you going to do? And then he realized he doesn't have his ring anymore. It's not on him. And then that's when all of a sudden a giant wasp appears behind all of the, the, the manhunters, grabs their staffs and pulls them up. And just as they do that, that's when they fire and they miss every single lantern in the room. And at the exact same moment that that happens, another construct of tendrils go and grab all of the rings and they go right back on all the fingers of all the other lanterns. Turns out that um, Jordan gave his ring 
to Bzzd, and Bzzd managed to use it to do exactly that and rescue all of the Green Lanterns himself single-handedly. So then you've got the melee of the Green Lantern Corps versus the Manhunters, and eventually they take them down, obviously. I'm not going to go into specifics of a battle. I can't do that. But you have Sinestro, who's completely cornered at the end. And he grabs one of the Manhunter staffs and he's holding it up. And obviously that's no match for the combined strength of the Green Lantern Corps. But he says something along the lines of, this isn't the end. And then he takes the staff, puts it up to his head, and pulls the trigger. Boom! No more head. He's gone. He's dead. But he's not, because that's not actually Sinestro. You've got wires, you've got the big switcheroo kind of ending there. And now you have the question of, wait a minute, this is like a small manhunter. He must have done this, he must have had this being created on Quard before he was able to, or while he was in the science cell. So the question is then, where is Sinestro? Well, turns out that during all the melee and everything that was happening, down in this forging room, which I guess you could have established, I didn't really mention it, but you could establish this earlier on when you're doing a tour of Oa's, the forging room where they're actually crafting the power rings for lanterns and future lanterns. Um, it had been broken into and some manhunters got in there, killed some people, and there's a ring missing. Turns out that trying to overthrow the guardians and trying to destroy the core, none of that was actually his end goal that day. He managed to get out with the one thing that he wanted. So then you skip ahead to Quard. And Sinestro manages to contact the weaponeers and they transport him there. And he goes towards them and says, I need you to reverse engineer this weapon. The Quardians get, or weaponeers get super excited because now they have their very own Green Lantern ring to, t to tinker with. And let's see what they come up with. I'll bet you it's yellow. But at the end, the Green Lantern still managed to prevail. It was a loss, but at the same time, it was a win. The Guardians end up becoming a lot more clear. Their motivations, their um, driving factors, everything. They basically come clean with the Lanterns. They change the Book of Oa, which is the history. And they include everything, even the things they're embarrassed about. Turns out that it wasn't some sort of a cleansing of life per se that the not per se that the the guardians wanted they wanted to cleanse the the uh, the the sector 666 of a disease that was running through there unfortunately when the manhunters got there they malfunctioned and they regarded life as the disease and they exterminated everything that was the day that the guardians had to leave their citadel and take care of all or take care they had to get rid of all of the manhunters and start new and that's when they started the Green Lantern Corps. They hit it more out of shame. And Guardians aren't supposed to feel any emotions. And uh, that day they felt shame. So after that, they closed it off, decided to make a power based on will. And um, Green Lantern Corps was formed. So now they stand stronger together and ready for anything that the universe can throw at them, be it power-hungry dictators, be it uh, giant robots, be it anything. The Green Lantern Corps stands ready. And then you've got kind of a nice little thing at the end where I think that Jordan, um, though he's been working hard, and I had originally thought that he'd been essentially gone from Earth since he'd been recruited for two plus years. And um, it's a big sector, and he hasn't been home in two years, and they grant him leave. So then you can have some sort of a tie-in where, you know, he encounters some of the heroes on Earth. You don't have to do that. You can do something completely. You can do whatever you want with that, but it leaves it nice and open-ended. Um, and then the post-credit stinger would be, or at least this is what I see, but because uh, I like the character of Trostis, the post-credit stinger would be back on Yismol. You see that um, uh, Atrocitus is not off his own one arm. He's got a little stub. And he's also managed to kill his other compatriots in the Five Inversions terrorist cell. He manages to sacrifice them to some sort of a god and blood ritual that's reminiscent of some of the stuff that you saw in the murals back on Ryud. And all of a sudden the blood forms and it forms to the symbol of what the Red Lantern Corps looks like in the books. So now you're setting up for a potential spinoff of a War of Light between Sinestro Corps the Red Lanterns, and the Green Lanterns. 
So anyways, that's my crazy shit. <laughs> I, uh, I probably put a lot more thought in this than I should have. Um, but it was fun. It was kind of a fun exercise. It made me really explore kind of what I like about the Green Lantern series and what I'd like to see in a film. Um, basically, I'd like to see the core work as a core. Um, I don't know that I would start off a brand new Lantern film with a ton of new characters. I think you'd want to start with one, have that be the anchor, and then really introduce other characters. And then from that point, you can really just start expanding the universe more and more based on how popular the series I get. You know, the popular the series gets, I think. Um, I think, personally, that's more digestible for, for most, and it leaves a lot of um, open endings for possible interaction with other DC characters. So, anyways... I'm done talking. It's been about just over a half hour, so I'm going to call it. Um, thank you guys for listening or watching if you're watching me ramble on YouTube. Um, but uh, it's been fun. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode, this pitch. And, uh, well, see you next time. Cheers. <laughs>